I live in the Philippines and I'm currently studying in the capital city, Manila. The district of the school I had been studying was full of high-end malls, bars and extravagant hotels and condominiums that face Manila Bay. Besides this, a few universities made it a vibrant area that was filled with students having an amazing time and dozens of foreigners from different nationalities that had made Manila their home. In my third year as a student, I had to accomplish my third but last thesis to fulfil this requirement. I spent practically morning to night in my university, scouring the library and the online databases my school could provide. It was 8am to 8pm for a whole month. On one such day, I exited my university around 10pm and walked to the nearest bus station, tired but satisfied, as rush hour had finished, that meant that the ride home would only be one hour and not two. As I walked to the bus station, even in my tired state, I was aware that someone was following me. I started noticing a tall built man, slightly muscular, wearing an I love the Philippines white t-shirt, jean shorts and he was going the same route I was. In the light street filled avenue, it wasn't uncommon to see such people around that time. After all, for most of them, the night was only starting. I tried to shrug off my discomfort and held the numerous books in my arms closer. In my mind, I was panicking though. I couldn't see anyone around us. Even the banks themselves didn't have the usual guards at the doors. As I reached the bus stop, I tried to calm myself and he took his place beside me. Sneaking a peek at him, he was tall, probably about 5 foot 10. I felt myself panic, seeing as I'm only 4 foot 9 and carrying a bag full of heavy books. I wasn't ready to bolt away and run. I decided that worst comes to worst, I should just walk as fast as I can back to school that was only a few blocks away. So as we're waiting for the bus, I just begin to think, and I was so inside my head that I didn't hear him start talking. You're early, he said. Excuse me? Whores like you don't usually have customers at this time. Shocked. I told him that I was not a hooker, but a student, lifting my books and even raising my ID up to his gaze. Don't get me wrong, I understand that since this is a buzzing city with many bars and clubs, the women he was talking about were common at night, but to think that I, a girl, clearly wearing a uniform and carrying books in a bag, could be one of those, was just stupid in my opinion. Plus, how could he think a girl wearing a practice teacher uniform, carrying a backpack and books, would be someone who worked as a hooker. I know a whore when I see one. Whores here are students, like you. You're not special, but you're tiny. Like a child, but with tits. I like that a lot. How much? The shock I felt was easily replaced with anger and irritation of not knowing how I should respond to this arrogant man. He was debasing me on so many levels. I wanted to yell at him and curse, but what good would it be? I didn't respond, and I started walking back to my university, briskly, as fast as my legs could carry me. I tried to think and stop panicking, but that's when it began to overwhelm me. My mind kept shifting to what he said about how I looked. He said I looked like a kid, and that he liked that. I could hear his footsteps following. He liked that I looked like a kid. Shit, I have an arrogant paedophile after me. You're all whores for money. How much? I can pay more than you can count. He continued to yell as I briskly walked. He tried to catch up to me. I swear on my life though, I thought my heart would explode at the rate it was pounding. My university door was a block away and I kept walking. 
as I tried to drown out what he was yelling. I was about to pass the gate of my university and was praying to God that the guard was on duty in the front when I realised to my horror that no one was there and that my university gates were closed. The guards on duty must have gone to the bathroom or something. I glanced back and he was there following me, his face red from walking and yelling. With my day and the energy that it was taking to ditch this man, I was growing extremely tired and hopeless but I walked on, knowing that a street away, a 7-Eleven was there, perhaps a place I could ditch the guy by talking to the guard on duty, perhaps lose him on the streets visibly filled with people, if I would be so lucky. But suddenly, I was blessed by something better. I was about to cross the street when an empty passenger van bound for my home city stopped beside me. I nearly wept upon seeing it. Since I rode the bus around about this time of night, and these vans were usually already full of people and too crowded for me to go home. But I could hear the man's pace suddenly quicken, and in my panic I chucked myself into the passenger side of the decelerating van and locked it. As we struck on the red light, the man was able to catch up with the van and started to knock on the window and started talking to me, his eyes looking straight into mine through the glass. Come on, don't be like that. We were just having fun. We'll have more fun if you step out. No, leave me alone, you pervert. Hearing my response, he started banging at the window vigorously. And the driver of the van suddenly pulled out a gun and shouted at the man to go away, otherwise he'd blow his head off. The creepy guy began backing away, but not before spitting against the glass and pressing his face as close as he could to mine, and whispered, Whore. The light turned green, and the van sped away. I didn't look behind to see what happened to the guy, but just began to cry. The driver drove furiously until we reached a red light, and asked what happened, and I told him. After hearing what I had to say, he looked blankly at the road, and seeing the green light started driving again less frantically, let him be. Let the Lord deal with that crazy man, he said. I just sat there dazed and tired with the whole ordeal. So crazy paedophile man I met. Please, let's never meet again. When I was six, 28 years ago, my mom and dad took me and my younger sister to an MLB game, leaving my grandmother to babysit my youngest sister. When we got back, my grandmother told my folks that two guys had come by the house with photography equipment and asked whether a young girl with red curly hair lived there. They said that they had spotted her and that she would be a great child model for some advertising work that they were doing. When my grandmother said that she wasn't home, they said they would come back another time. My grandmother and mom didn't think much about it, but my dad said, something's not right here, and called the police. Fifteen minutes later, several FBI agents showed up and began conducting interviews with my grandmother and my parents, while I ran around and showed the agents my Matchbox police helicopter. Turns out, we had been targeted by a child theft ring. The photographers would take a bunch of photos and wait until the toddler threw a tantrum, and the photographers would then ask the mother to grab a toy to keep the child entertained. While the mother was out of the room, they would grab the child and bolt, leaving everything else behind. The FBI told my folks that my sister had already been sold and would have been out of the country within 24 hours if they got her. We were advised to change preschools and other aspects of our daily routine. It still gives me the chills to think about what could have happened to her. Needless to say, Mom became very overprotective. It was a few years before she even trusted us with a babysitter. I moved into the neighborhood that I live in right now about 10 years ago when I was 9. The school district in this area is really good and a new elementary school had just opened up at the time, so my parents thought it would be a great place to go. Everything went fine and dandy for the most part. I attended third grade at the school and my sister went to middle school, not too far from it. One day though, my sister came home with a note from the school admins. Apparently, there had been an increasing report on reports of child predators 
lurking in the area. Whether these had been noted via children telling their parents of their encounters, or terrified parents reporting their missing children, I was too young to know. The notice warned parents about it, telling them to have caution with their children. Naturally, hearing this, my rather protective, exceptionally Asian parents sat me and my sister down and nearly gave us the whole shebang when it came to child predators. They told us the terrible things a predator would do to us without ever mentioning the word rape. Suffice to say, she and I got the gist of it. What I remember most clearly about the exchange is the pains that they went to to make sure we would catch on to any of the tricks of a potential child kidnapper. They'll ask you if you've seen a little dog, my mother said. They'll ask you to help them look for it as an example. Even though we were sufficiently spooked, I went to school the next day without thinking about it too much. After all, I didn't think it would ever happen to me. Now, because the elementary school was so entrenched in the neighbourhood, it was within a short biking distance. I rode there every morning and rode home every evening. And that day was the same. I remember turning the corner of a sidewalk and riding towards the T intersection, the corner of which my house occupied. As I was leisurely biking along, a truck slowly pulled into the street and drove up next to me. I want to say it was a black big pickup truck, but I can't remember what it was exactly. What I do recall is it slowing down and looking over at me as the window rolled down. A man leaned out. I think he looked young, but as a child I had a somewhat skewed sense of age judgement. I remember very clearly though that he was Caucasian. He asked me, Have you seen a little dog? I was so spooked. I stared at him with wide eyes for a moment before biking full speed, diagonally, across the road to my house as fast as I could. I remember glancing back over my shoulder to see him look around before turning into another intersection. What I don't remember is what I told my parents when I got home. The next day I got pulled out of class by the principal. She took me to an unoccupied classroom that wasn't being used for lack of people. She asked me all sorts of things about the man. What did he look like? What kind of car was he driving? How old he thought I was? I couldn't give them a very good description because I didn't know much about car makes or models and I was afraid of any concrete details I could give them would just be my brain trying to fill the gaps. She thanked me and told me that a police report would be issued. I didn't hear anything after that, but for a long time, I was scared of being out in the neighbourhood alone. Five years later when I was in middle school, I learned that one of the kindergarten teachers at the elementary school got booked for child molestation. Two years after that when I was in high school, it was one of the gym teachers, so the area really did have a bit of a problem. At any rate, I never learned what became of my police report. Maybe that man really was just looking for his dog. But whatever the case, sir, let's never meet again. This just happened recently. A guy made a Craigslist posting saying that he was a talent scout and ran an agency. He got the interest of a father, grandfather, and his granddaughter. This guy's specialty was casting families preferably children, under the guise that he was looking to produce a film and needed actors. Not too long ago, the grandfather and his granddaughter went to meet this guy up at the house. They actually drove about two hours early to check out the house before going to it. The family drove by later at the agreed time of meeting in the morning and were greeted at the door by a man in a suit. He tried to convince the little girl to come inside many times. The grandfather got a bad feeling and left. Turns out, in an unrelated sting, the police caught this guy for child porn charges. He had 10 counts of child porn and his home was raided. The father and granddaughter, around the same time, reported this incident to the police. When the police found this guy, he had a bag with him. In it was a knife, zip ties, sex toys, and he even had plastic sheeting. 
He was going to pretty much kill the grandfather and then rape and murder the child. His plan was to get this all on film. The camera was set up and ready to go. Luckily, the father and grandfather had a gut feeling something was off and reported the incident. This guy happened to be a kid I pretty much grew up knowing for about 15 years. He was even my brother's roommate for a while. He was always very creepy and I could never pinpoint exactly why. I felt my stomach drop reading this news. The guy had been inside my home, went to parties I had, my birthday party. I've had multiple conversations with him. Luckily, he won't be getting out of jail anytime soon. I've included some news stories for further clarification. I was at a mate's house spending the night when I was in middle school. As expected, we'd stay up to all hours which didn't matter most of the time except the bathroom was right near his parents' room. About the only time we'd get into trouble would be when someone would wake them up when nature called. To avoid this, we'd just go out to the basement door and pee in the woods. The door stayed unlocked most of the time because we managed to lock ourselves out more than once. This was also compounded by the fact that we'd all wander out and find something to do in the woods on a regular basis. This night, his older brother was home and kept barging in the basement door and raining chaos from above. So we decided to lock the door just to deter him. Not that it really would have kept him out, but at least he'd have to come and use the key, which meant that when he tried barging in, there'd no longer be any fun in it. So around about midnight, we start to hear the handle jiggle and we didn't think much of it, figuring it was his brother. After about five minutes of on and off fondling, we finally hit the door and yelled for him to stop. And then there was silence. No response, no more clattering of the handle. Great, great. We can move on now, right? Well, about 10 minutes later, it started again, and the process repeated. This went on about two hours, until finally, after telling him to stop, we just said, screw it, and ignored him. He continued for about 30 minutes after our last attempt to stop him, and then he just gave up. Well, fast forward to about 9am. We were just stirring and one of my mates had to go to the bathroom. If you've ever had a sleepover like that, there are bodies everywhere, all over the floor, wherever there was space. And at once the person starts walking around you, it sort of stirs the nest. We all started stretching and making our way to relieve ourselves after all the sodas that we'd binged the night before. As I go walk outside, I grab the door handle and close it behind me and I noticed that it felt rough. After looking at it I saw the space around the keyhole was all but destroyed. There were giant scratch marks on every surface and the metal guides were bent and skewed. I asked my friend who lived there what had happened and he said it was the first time he'd ever seen it not really wanting to be blamed for something that his brother did. We went upstairs and told his parents about the night before. After his dad went down to see what it was we were talking about, he went completely white and ran upstairs to call the police. Evidently, someone had been trying to force the lock open whilst we were inside. That's actually how. What freaks me out though, is that this person knew we were in there and that we knew they were trying to get in. And despite this, he repeatedly tried to force his way inside. God knows what kind of person that would be. Hey guys, it's Mort here and thank you so much for listening. As you can obviously tell, some people in this world are truly disturbed. But don't let it get you down as when you subscribe, like and even share this video, your day will be so much better and so will mine. Something even better though, 
is that we're not even done yet. Over on Mr. Davis' channel, we have the remaining five stories of this 10 part collection. So seriously, go check it out as I have saved the best stories for part two. So come on, follow me over, that's where I'll be. But if you've just dropped in from his channel, you can click on the lower right hand link to see another one of my videos, which I'm sure you'll love. So go check it out. Remember, you can submit your story and all the info you will find in the description. Don't forget, we have the competition going on. I expect to see some entries soon, guys. And you can stalk me on Twitter and Instagram. But for now, I'm going over to Mr. Davis' channel. Stay awesome, and I'll see you over there.